Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So in this episode, I wanted to talk to you guys about a trending topic a lot of doctors out here have been making videos on. So I figured I'd jump in and give my opinion on my top 10 things I wish that I knew before I went to med school. Stay tuned. So as you guys know, I'm an anesthesiologist. So I went to medical school and I did residency. Now I would like to impart some wisdom to you guys that are prospective medical students on what I thought would be great to know before I got into the whole process. So first things first, you're gonna spend a lot of time studying for medical school. This is obviously a very well-known fact that you're going to have to spend time training med in medical school and then after you graduate you're also going to have to do residency. So on average for anesthesiology you're going to be spending four years in medical school after four years of undergrad and then you're also going to be doing four more years of training as a resident. So that's eight years plus your four of undergrad, 12 years on average. And then if you seek to do a fellowship training after residency, that's an additional one year. So altogether, you can be looking at 13 years of post high school um, training that you're going to have to complete before you're all done with your training to become an anesthesiologist. In my specific case, as a non-traditional student, I, um, after graduating from undergrad, went ahead and taught high school for three years. So add on an additional three years to that whole process. And here I am 15 years later, plus, because I've been in attending for about five years. So just say 15 years later, I was a full-fledged anesthesiologist and began my life. So you're looking at a pretty hefty time commitment if you're going to pursue medical school. So the numbers are always mentioned, but it's the reality of like what those years mean for you when you're going in. So that's a time sacrifice that doesn't really hold as much weight when heard as as opposed to when experienced. So just know that going in, you're going to be spending lots and lots of time on this specialty. Number two, cost. So that's you know also something that everyone knows med school is expensive of course we all know this so here's a list of the 10 medical schools in the united states with the lowest in-state costs according to the u.s news and world report on march 24 2020 so we have at the top of the list texas tech university health sciences center with an in-state tuition and fees of 18,800 not bad. University of New Mexico at 19,000. University of North Texas Health Science Center at 19,486. Texas A&M University at 19,724. University of Texas. Okay, so go to school in Texas because they're in the top five. <laughs> um, after that, we have SUNY Upstate Medical University at 22,451. Actually waitlisted there. West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine, Marshall University Edwards in West Virginia, and then East Carolina University, North Carolina. So the highest um, annual tuition out of that list was $25,860. So yeah, the takeaway is apply to med school in Texas. There are so many different options and it's so much cheaper than the other states. Number three on the top 10 list, knowing that your life is not your own for the time that it's going to take you to get through med school and residency. So what do I mean by that? Well, when you're training and you're also, you know, learning um, all about how to become a doctor, you're going to be spending most of your time in the hospital. And when you're in the hospital and you're learning, you're usually at the mercy of those who are training you as far as when you can take days off when you can have vacation. So just be prepared to spend a lot of time listening to other people tell you what to do. And as long as you're okay with that, then you're good to go. Four, number four on the list, delayed start of your family. So you're going to, again, spend a lot of time in training. Those are usually your fertile years, your 20s, your early 30s. Reason number five, your weekends, nights, national holidays are all things of the past you will be doing as much training as possible so you're going to spend a lot of time again the time factor in the hospital so being able to plan you know time off 
for vacation, things like that, it's really not going to be a liberty of yours during this time frame. So just be prepared for that part and know that when you're all done, your life can resume again. Reason number six, your friends and family may now, knowing that you have medical knowledge, treat you like a minute clinic. They may ask you <laughs> for all of the questions that they have pertaining to their own physical conditions and may ask and probably expect you to write prescriptions for them or you know diagnose their their rare combination of symptoms and try to get out of going to actual doctors <laughs> now they may actually come to you and ask you to diagnose their conditions and write prescriptions for them even if you're a first year resident and you don't even know what's going on yourself but just that being said, you know much more than many, so you should use that knowledge wisely, but also understand your limitations and um, refer them to their own doctors. Reason number seven, with power comes responsibility. So you know that pretty much you're gonna have a lot of authority as a physician, but there is also a lot of responsibility that comes along with it. Specifically, you know, your ethical and moral and obviously legal obligation to taking care of your patient first and putting them at the forefront of all of the things that you do as a physician once you become a physician it's up to you to use your authority wisely reason number eight burnout is a thing according to the ama over 40 percent of physicians are burnt out how does this happen well workload of course is one of the sources but inefficient systems is another including having to do a lot of administrative work um, and experiencing a lot of barriers to workflow on a daily basis so choosing where you work is really, really key to figuring out how well and smoothly things in your profession will go. Um, in anesthesiology, I would say choosing where you work is, is, is the most important thing that you can do um, because it will allow you to have a certain flow of your day and lifestyle that would work for you and your own personal demands as well. So learning about and avoiding and finding ways to cope with signs and symptoms of physician burnout is going to be key to your success and happiness in medicine. One of the reasons why I went into anesthesiology was to avoid having to deal with on a daily basis some of the things that lead most commonly to physician burnout. For example, like administrative processes such as medical record documentation and coding requirements. Those are things that I definitely deal with on a superficial level as an acute care physician. But if I was to do something more chronically um, oriented, then I would be more likely to have to deal with. So that's one of the reasons why I decided to do anesthesia. The red tape, I feel, is far less than many other specialties. And the paperwork aspect is not as, in my opinion, is not as overwhelming as it might be in other specialties. So those are some reasons why I chose it. So 12 of the external factors that have been reported by the AMA as continuing to impact physician burnout and professional well-being are the standardization of the healthcare industry can cause declines in a physician's sense of control, flexibility, and autonomy. Legal regulations and standards. So growing administrative requirements interfere with patient care at times and can drain time and morale from physicians. Healthcare reform and payment policies. So these payment policies and requirements cause substantial administrative burden, financial pressures, and other negative effects that can cause physicians to leave their practices. Medical record documentation and coding requirements. These are multiple sources of burnout because they lead to duplicative and inconsistent requirements that are burdensome and time consuming for physicians. And then there's quality measuring and reporting. Also. Efforts to decrease the burden associated with this are ongoing, but they tend to be a source of burdens placed on physicians because they are dupl duplicative and also sometimes not clinically relevant. And so on and so forth. Maintaining your professional licensure, expensive and sometimes very tedious of a process. That's another source of frustration and can be a little bit of a bothersome chore, but is necessary. And then last but not least, maintenance of cert certification. Once you're a licensed physician, you have to maintain your board certification. That's bringing us to reason number nine. So reason number nine, MOCA. MOCA, that phrase is specific to anesthesiologists. So maintenance of board certification in anesthesiology. 
and um, it's something that you have to do for the entirety of your licensure. You have to continuously exhibit a constant continuing education um, process going on. So you're going to be um, required to have an active unrestricted license to practice medicine in at least one jurisdiction of the United States. Um, lifelong learning and self-assessment. So you need to earn 250 category one CMEs or continuing medical education credits and 20 must be approved by the American Board of Anesthesiologists. And then three, assessment of knowledge, judgment, and skills. Mocha minute questions. You need to do 30 questions per calendar quarter, 120 per year. And then you have to do improvement of medical practice activities, and that's based on um, your years of uh, certification. And so you get points for those and you need to be able to maintain your certification by doing all of those activities. So yeah, that's things that you don't know. This is thing number nine that I did not know before going into medicine, the requirement for maintaining your medical licensure. So you don't just take your test, pass it and do well and now you're a licensed doctor for life you have to maintain that licensure and renew the licenses which can be quite expensive so that's just part of it all and then thing number 10 that i wish i had known before going into medicine was that it was going to be such a rewarding career something that i look forward to doing every day that actually makes me happy, makes me feel like I'm using my full capacity of knowledge and ability every day. And just being able to help patients in many different aspects of their life, when they're really sick, when they're entering a new phase in life, like giving birth. I just feel very rewarded in what I do. And I hope that you will as well, if you do decide to pursue a career in anesthesiology. So with that, thank you guys for watching this video. I hope you learned a little bit more about medicine that we don't always talk about and that you go into it with a lot more knowledge than I did. All right, take care and be safe. Until next time.